For the first time in a month, it's race week. Formula One returns this weekend with the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort. In the second half of 2023, there are records to be broken and there is history to be made. It's been 10 years since this record was set. Nine in a row for Sebastian Vettel. He wins the Brazilian Grand Prix. Yes! We did it! Verstappen's on the verge of matching Vettel nine wins in a row. Then how many more in his quest to be our first triple world champion since? It is the championship in 2015 for Lewis Hamilton. And he is now a three-time world champion, Lewis Hamilton. The Triple Champions Club is exclusive. Not even Alonso's in it. But can Fernando make his own history this season a decade after win number 32? It's a second Spanish Grand Prix win for Fernando Alonso. He is right back at the top of the podium and wins in front of the faithful once more. Will the Spaniard complete Mission 33 this season or will Lando Norris take win number one? Light out, away we go. Max Verstappen getting off the line, but it's a good start by Norris. A very good start. Lando Norris leads. Can McLaren, Mercedes, Aston Martin or Ferrari prevent an historic Red Bull clean sweep? A 12th race win in a row for Red Bull. That'll be the record for races won consecutively from the start of the season. It'll be a 13th win in a row for Red Bull overall. 12 down, 10 to go. Welcome back to F1 Nation. We're going to discuss all things Anvil on this week's episode of F1 Nation with me, Tom Clarkson, Damon Hill and Pedro De La Rosa. Guys, great to get the band back together. Before we talk all things Zanvo, though, what's everyone been up to during the summer break? I can't speak for Pedro because I think he's probably been somewhere sunny, but I've been in England where I've been watching it rain constantly. I've, I've been in Mallorca, Damon, so I have had a fantastic uh, couple of weeks here, cycling every day with my mate Alex Woods, uh, being beaten by him as well uh, up the hill. So Some things never change, Pedro. Well, it did change last year, Tom. Last year, I beat Alex uh, Woods on the bike for the first time ever in my career. And uh, this year, he's beaten me again, uh, but only for six seconds. We have a little race in a, at the end of the summer to see who is fitter. And uh, I mean, I, let's say he's not fitter. He's just better than me on the bike only. Okay, uh, let, <laughs> let's leave it here. But it has been a fantastic break. I think that we've all charged our batteries. Uh, Damon, maybe you through the rain, I through the Spanish sun and uh, sea, but we're back. And Damon, how many birdies? How many birdies did you shoot last time you played golf? No, it's, it's all gone south, Tom. I don't know what has happened, but um, my... My golf has gone completely pear-shaped. And I'm, I'm supposed to be playing in this charity golf tournament called the, the Legends Celebrity Tour. It's a bolt-on to the Legends, which is the U European Seniors Tour. I could win a place in the final, which means I could earn like £25,000 for my charity. And I'm going to let them down badly because I can't hit a golf ball at all. Save my life. So that's golf. It's a, the most frustrating game ever invented. And it's a good walk spoiled. Really, I don't know why I do it. You're welcome in Mallorca next year, going on the bike with us. You look pretty fit and, and fast. Well, the great thing about cycling is I've noticed if you, the more you do cycling, the better you get. With golf, the more you do, the worse you get. So I'd much rather the cycling seems to be much more straightforward. And, and also you get, you get outside, beautiful. You know, the scenery in, in, um, in Mallorca is fantastic. I mean, it's, it is this, the cycling mecca, isn't it, of the world almost. Well, I did quite a lot of driving over the break, stayed in the UK, but one of the things I was able to do was listen to a lot of podcasts, catch up on a bit of radio, and there was one Formula One thing I listened to called Desert Island Discs. Damon, you'll be familiar with that. Um, Pedro, it is a, a weekly show where a celebrity gets quizzed about their life for the BBC, and Toto Wolff was on it at the end of July. 
Really interesting listen. Much of his story I already knew, of course, but I did learn two new things about Toto. One is that he's a big Phil Collins fan, but also he loves free diving. He can hold his breath up to five minutes and he can dive down to 30 metres. 30 metres. There you go. I didn't know that about Toto Wolf. Did you? That was a new one. That was uh, quite surprising. But uh, I should think holding your breath for that length of time, it's probably quite useful when they have the, the team bosses meetings, um, you know, and they're all in the same room. <laughs> he also talks about sustainable success, doesn't he? And when you're, you're winning championship after championship, how you keep the team motivated, keep setting goals. And, and, I, and I guess that applies to what Red Bull are doing this year, doesn't it? You know, Max Verstappen has more or less got the drivers' championship sewn up. They've got the constructors' championship more or less sewn up. They've won every race this year. How do you keep the guys on the ground motivated? It's very difficult. And I think this is the, the most difficult uh, thing that Red Bull is doing right now is uh, not only winning, but keep winning, keep maintaining the gap to the rest, you know, and developing the car. So it is, it's very difficult, but it proves that they are a great team and uh, that depth in that team uh, you know it's it's incredible it's not easy and i possibly this is the the biggest challenge any formula one team uh, faces it's similar to, in a way to in the early in the 80s when it used to swing backwards and forwards between mclaren and williams you know they were two teams and no one else could get a look in uh, of course mclaren are on the on the way back and you might even argue that williams are but to actually be sitting there as red bull watching mercedes mopping it up for how many years was it eight years and now it's the boot is on the other foot. It's so interesting seeing how these teams manage to get the right formula and then dominate. And then the others are then struggling to try and crack that stranglehold they have on it. And it, it's it's a real pressure. Can you imagine being the boss of the, a team like that? So Toto's had all the success and now he's sitting there and Christian is is probably rubbing his hands together, uh, you know, in considering how Toto now has, knows how it feels to watch the other guys winning all the time. Yes, I, I, I think, I think are, in the case of Red Bull is extremely uh, outstanding because if you look at the, the past 10, 15 years, they've always had one of the best chassis, you know, and when I, I mean chassis, I mean uh, mechanical and aero platforms. And it was only that during, uh, you know, the hybrid era, in the, the, the first few years, they had really an engine that was not reliable, not powerful enough. But they've always managed to win races during the years, uh, not having the best uh, the best engine. So therefore, in very different eras, you know, with the blown diffuser, with the hybrid era, but with, uh, with now with the ground effect, but they've always had one of the best platforms there, you know, the chassis. And this is something that uh, it means that they've managed to retain talent Talent, but also grow as a team and uh, you know with all the all the different changes in the regulations so I think it's uh, interesting Pedro if Red Bull had had a Mercedes power unit in the early years of the hybrid era do you think they would have beaten Mercedes and I, I don't know Tom uh, the, the honest answer is that they would have challenged Mercedes very closely you know, and uh, it would have been a lot more interesting for all of us to watch, really, because uh, the, the, especially in the first few years of the hybrid era. But they would have been very close to the Mercedes uh, car, you know, uh, for sure. It's difficult to say if they would have beaten them or not. Mercedes ha has done an outstanding job as well, you know. And uh, but but it would have been very very interesting, and it would have gone gone down to down to the wire to the last few races of the season, like in 2021. Well, look, while we're talking Red Bull, has anyone seen their Las Vegas short film on YouTube? It's it's a preview to the big race that's happening. When is it? It's Saturday the 18th of November, isn't it? But has anyone seen that acting skills of, of Christian Horner, Checo Perez? I haven't seen it yet, Tom. Um, and it's difficult to, uh, for our listeners to see it on the podcast. So... Um, but, but we, how we can, point them how, to it. We can explain, <laughs> <laughs> explain it graphically to them. <laughs> what is it about? It's a spoof of the Hangover movie. And um, let's just say that Christian Horner is closer to Daniel Craig, I think. Not that Daniel Craig was in the movie, but in terms of his acting skills, than let's say Checo is to Bradley Cooper. It's amusing. Um, it just, I'll tell you what it does. It just, it reminds you, yes, we've got 10 races in 14 weeks, but there's a lot to look forward to. And Vegas is going to be something else. Just, I mean, what a venue, you know, there aren't going to be any Red Bulls on the roof of the hotel like there is in this movie, but it's, 
it's just there's going to be so much razzmatazz. It's going to be very Formula One. Tom, let, let's say that watching the video, uh, we can say that Checo is a better racing driver than, than an actor. Could, could we summarize that? <laughs> <laughs> could we? Yeah, I think you put that brilliantly. <laughs> watching Horner and Perez in action reminded us of someone else's acting skills. Damon Hill leads into the first bend. Murray. There's been a shunt. It's Hill. Murray, we're just out for a quiet pizza. Stop commentating. Sorry. We'll have the pepperoni, please. And here comes the pasta. It's a pizza, Murray. Hill's going for it. And he spun his pizza through 180 degrees. And Hill finishes second again. Watch it, Baldy. <laughs> Damon, defend yourself. That was quite a long time ago, Tom. I think there's probably some listeners who weren't even born when that was released. But it was out when I was racing and uh, was a famous pizza uh, chain that um, uh, got me and the commentator, the famous commentator, Murray Walker, to do a commercial, which was a lot of fun. But it meant it required me to bite into a pizza uh, repeatedly until they got the right shot. And then I had to spit the pizza out into the, the bucket. Otherwise, I'd have ballooned up to twice my weight um, because we had to do it so many times. But um, I did come away from that particular film shoot stinking of uh, pepperoni, I think it was. Uh, well, better actor than Checo Perez. I thought a little bit disrespectful with that last line. Shut it. Yeah, I, well, actually, it's worse than that because they, they said I, they wanted me to grab um, dear old Murray by the lapels and... and pull him towards me as if in some sort of gangster movie and and become very threatening towards him, which was <laughs> very unnatural for me. As you know, Tom, I'm, I'm a peace-loving man and uh, or pizza-loving man. <laughs> hey. Sorry, dude. Oh, boom, boom. Still got it. Um, but um, no, yeah, it was, it was poor old Murray. I grabbed him by the lapels and I really just gave him a good old shake. Well, why don't we start talking about the upcoming Dutch Grand Prix? He hasn't led every lap, but he is going to go on and win the race and once more extend that championship lead that he's held since the Spanish Grand Prix because for the second year running here at Zandvoort, Max Verstappen wins the Dutch Grand Prix. He won both of those races from pole. Can Max make it three wins in a row at the Dutch Grand Prix? Well... Definitely, I think that the answer has to be yes. No, I mean, uh, his uh, his home Grand Prix, he's uh, like he's flying in any type of track, in any type of condition, wet, dry, semi wet. So he's definitely the the, the big favorite. He will have a uh, hundred thousands uh, of spectators pushing him. I, I'm, I mean, reviewing last year's race there, it was an interesting one because it was a very strategic race. So he he not only won on the track by being the fastest car, not by a lot in terms of, of uh, qualifying pace or pure uh, one lap pace, but also on the strategic call. So it was a, it was an interesting Grand Prix. And I just hope that we have also an interesting Grand Prix, no matter who wins. And if it's even Max, you know, I just hope that we have an interesting one uh, because he's shown so much superiority on the last few races that it's, it's a bit worrying in effect. So he's got a bigger car advantage going into his home race this year than he did last year. I think I think what he has this year is that uh, he has a more complete car. So the, the car is uh, superior, yes, but it's working very well in any type of tracks, you know, in every different uh, different type of tracks. Conditions, you know, it seems to be behaving very well in the wet conditions. We saw that in Spa. So it is it, it, it's something to consider that uh, we are going to have a, a, a very different track sunboard it has uh, it lacks long straights uh, the drs effect is is smaller it's uh, very asymmetric it's very hard on the tires blah 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 but it doesn't really matter because the bottom line is that we know that the red bulls will be very competitive anyway yeah anyway, it's, it's difficult to imagine or even remember that that lewis looked like he was quite it was almost on for a win last time in zanville he was in the in the hunt but of course they just couldn't keep it together in the Eventually, the tyres, I think the, the the strong point of Red Bull, the weak point for them is in qualifying is that they can't quite get the tyres into the window, it, it seems, in the same way, because they're preserving their their tyres for the race. And the, in, in the race, they just um, they just out-tire everyone. Their endurance on their 
some tyre wear is way way better than anyone else's. So it just extends during the race distance and everyone else just falls away. So um, I should think we'll see that repeated. But it's possible he's out-qualified. I mean, what about, what about a McLaren putting in a stunning performance? I mean, maybe the straight line speed thing that they have the the deficit to to red bull will hold them back because of the long straight but the corn it's made up of quite a lot of tight twisty corners where it could be strong for mclaren yes i think it's very difficult to say who will be strong uh, in sandboard you know i mean apart from red bull it's so tight there there is uh, like four teams like within a few 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 tenths uh however i would say that it's like that I think the teams that went well in Hungary, that went well possibly in in Monaco, you know, they, they should behave well in this type of track because, as Damon was saying, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of twisty corners. Uh, there's also several medium high speed, but they're, they're they're not long straights really, you know. So efficiency is not that critical in in Sambor. I love it as a race track because it's got such a wonderful flow to it. I know it's been slightly reconfigured since the days when you guys raced Formula Three there. Um, but it still now has uh, it's sort of high speed. It's undulating. Look at the turn three, the bank turn three. It's a really interesting racetrack. And when you combine that with you know the beach vibe that you have, you know you can see the sea from the racetrack, and and you know it's going to be a sea of orange. It, it's it's a unique racetrack in that way because you know so often you know like the the great racetracks, the spas, the Silverstones. You know, they are in the middle of nowhere, wonderful racetracks. But this has a completely different atmosphere to those while still having just a, a legendary status. And let's not forget that the first Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort was back in 1952 and was won for Ferrari by Alberto Ascari. There is a lot of history associated to this race as well. Yes, there was a long gap from 1985 to 2021 when there wasn't a race there, but it's one of the the returnees that I've really welcomed in the last few years. Um, it's a special track. I'm really pleased that both of you guys are going to be there this weekend because it, it's kind of, it's fitting that the F1 Nation team is together at such a great race. But And then just to see Max win it, what has he got? He's uh, He's won eight races. He's won the last eight races, I should say. He's got a 125 point lead. It's going to be a celebration of Max Verstappen this weekend. He's going to sell a lot of T-shirts, hats, miniature helmets. If you're not a Max Verstappen fan, don't go to Zandvoort this weekend. D- Tom, did you hear what the uh, the guy who's running the the event uh, for, uh, for Zandvoort uh, was saying to the to basically to the fans, the Dutch fans, we, we can't have all these flares going off um, and they want to make it more welcoming to non-Max Verstappen fans. I mean, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck I mean, with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I've not been to this event when it's been a, a Max Verstappen uh, celebration, you know, um, and don't forget it's bouncing on the back of, I know it was a, you know, three weeks ago, whatever it was, but but uh, his other country that he's a member of is Belgium, and he's come from Spa, having won there. So he's basically mopping up all the support and the love and affection for him. So it's going to be, uh, I've heard it's a bit noisy in the paddock. And Damon, what is it like to be a rival in that sort of situation, to be Lewis Hamilton, to be Charles Leclerc going to Zandvoort this weekend? Because you will have witnessed that going to Hockenheim in the mid-90s, which was the Michael Schumacher stronghold. Is it intimidating when you you know, you see the stadium section there just covered in, in Ferrari fans, Benetton fans, uh, flags as well in, in 94, 95? What, what was that like? Well, it's interesting you, you, you use Hockenheim as an example because actually the designer of the Hockenheim circuit is the same guy that designed Zandvoort and also Suzuka. And those, those are circuits I really loved. I love the infield section of Hockenheim, really tricky, undulating, and the change of camber and stuff made it an interesting drive, as, as it was with Zandvoort and Suzuka. But, but going to Hockenheim in the heat of uh, Schumacher mania uh, you can imagine you've got this stadium section where you've got well, 150,000 people or something all sitting around the, the infield and they were all cheering for <laughs> for Michael, obviously, and they used to hold up. So you, you go the, on the track parade before the race and they, um, people hold up banners and they, I remember them holding up banners and calling me Benny Hill and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> and um, who was his first, so Benny Hill, for, again, for listeners who weren't born, uh, was an English comedian who was rather ridiculous. But anyway, um, but that's not me. Anyway, so I went to Hockenheim in the heat of the Michael Schumacher uh, mania thing. And I was met by two policemen. I was met by my team boss 
who said, you better come inside the motorhome because uh, we've got a bit of a problem. And so I said, what's thinking, what the hell's going on? There's two policemen there. Anyway, some guy had written to the police saying that if Damon outqualifies Michael, then he will shoot me um, with a gun uh, <laughs> at some point during the weekend. So I literally had to hide away in my hotel room. I phoned up a friend who I got to come over and stay with me. And, we, and I had all the curtains drawn. No, this is no, no exaggeration. I was brought in in the back of the car uh, through the woods by the police so that I didn't go in through the main entrance. And then when it came to the start of the race, they put us in the, in the back of some open top cars, some old bangers. Literally, I was sitting next to David Coulthard and I was being driven around the circuit and I was clinging on to him. <laughs> yeah. But then they, you come into the stadium section and then they're letting off fireworks and there's bangs going off and everything. I was a complete nervous wreck. And, and how was the, the race car. after all that? I mean, did it affect you uh, psychologically or it was just a joke? You took it as a joke? I think I crashed, uh, Pedro. I don't know. I can't remember. Can <laughs> did you out-qualify Michael as per the guy's I think, letter? I, I, I probably did. I think it was, I can't remember whether that was 96 or 95. But anyway, it was um, intense. The pressure, I think, is on Max. And I think that Christian made this point when they first went there, when he, he was so much expectation. Imagine the first Dutch Grand Prix for God knows how many years, 30-odd years. And there's a Dutch driver who can win the Dutch Grand Prix. And the expectation is huge on a driver like that. So he's a young guy and Christian made the point that he coped with the expectation extremely well and, and didn't put a foot wrong all weekend as we've come to expect of him now. But uh, it is it's it is it's harder on that guy. I think it's harder, like, say, you know, Sergio Perez going to Mexico for the first, you know, first time. And, the, you know, your whole country wants you to do amazing things. That can be uh, quite difficult to cope with. I, I agree with you, Damon. I mean, I think that if if there's one difficult Grand Prix for Max this season, is his home Grand Prix. I mean, he he obviously his his standards are so high that everyone is demanding or expecting so much from him everywhere in qualifying, in free practice, in the race. He, everyone is expecting something special, which is an added pressure by its nature. But but then when you go to your home Grand Prix and you wake up in the morning, you see everyone dressed in orange. Everyone is uh, supporting you and you you cannot make a mistake. You have to drop the clutch at the right moment at the start, make the right calls. You know, uh, it is it is really an added pressure that it is um, most of the times works in your against you, you know. So it, it is it's not going to be an easy an easy Grand Prix for Max because of all this pressure he will have water off a duck's back pedro of all the people on the grid i see pressure affecting max verstappen less than any other driver he thrives yeah, on it it's it's called it's called quality uh, tom you know when you have the quality you 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 are you can put things in boxes you know you can put the pressure in a box close it down and concentrate on what you love to do which is uh, is is racing you know but it's still an added pressure not by the pressure itself of the people and wanting to deliver, but also because you have more commitments, you have more PR events, you might be a bit uh, a bit more tired, you know, when you get into the car and uh, you haven't had the proper rest, uh, you, just because of the nature of things, you know, uh, one, one PR event leads to another. So it's still his um, favorite. I mean, it's fantastic to race in front of your people, but it's, it's an added pressure that is sometimes uh, sometimes not the best. I agree with Pedro. I think I think you have to be, you know, you, Tom. You you talked about Max' apparent uh, immunity to pressure, but you know, it, there's a lot that goes on, on inside people. And I remember when uh, Michael Schumacher equaled Fangio's fifth uh, title, and he literally broke down. Do you remember in the press conference he broke down the pressure that these guys experience? Even someone like Michael Schumacher, it, it's intense, and uh, they ded dedicate their lives to things, and 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 so. What goes on inside is is not immediately obvious, and of course, when you come to a race meeting, you have to not show any weakness at all. But in it, it, whichever way you cut it, it's a lot of expectation on one person in front of their entire nation, and uh, you can't just brush that aside. You know, um, it's very difficult. You can play tricks with your mind, but but honestly, it has to have some bearing on 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 the person themselves. We've partnered with AG One for this episode of F One Nation. So we're fresh off the back of the summer break, and even though I've taken a step back to enjoy some downtime, like many drivers on the grid, there's one area of my life that I've kept consistent, my nutrition. 
Yes, friends, as you know, AG1 is my number one choice when it comes to ensuring my body has all the multivitamins and probiotics it needs to keep me feeling energized. Just one scoop in water each morning and I know I'm starting my day off on the right foot. Because not only does it mean I'm getting a boost of hydration first thing, I'm also getting the added benefit of 75 high quality ingredients that give me the key daily nutrients my body was clearly craving before I started my AG1 journey. Since then, I've noticed a huge shift in my focus and overall energy levels. And let's face it, there's no room to be sluggish in Formula One. Plus, it just makes me feel good to know that I'm taking care of my body from the inside out. Forget what you know about traditional supplements, because AG1 is raising the standard for quality in the supplement category. AG1 is a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients that all work together to support your immune system and improve your gut health in one drinkable habit. So what are you waiting for? If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash F1 Nation. That's drinkag1.com forward slash F1 Nation. Check it out. Final thoughts on Max. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dazzle you with some statistics now. Most wins in a season. Max can break the record of 15 wins this year, the record that he set last year. Uh, most wins from pole position in a season. Nigel Mansell, 1992, and Sebastian Vettel in 2011 both won nine races from pole in a season. Max already has seven from pole this year, so that's very much in his sights. Uh, most championship points in a season is also another thing Max can achieve this year. He can eclipse the record of 454 points that he set last year. He's already on 314. In terms of podiums, Max has 12 from 12 this year. Only Michael Schumacher has finished in the top three in every race of a season. That was back in 2002. Can Max do that this year? So there's a lot that he can still achieve. How much do you think he's motivated by statistics? Oh, well, Tom, first of all, I must say that uh, we, we are now in front of the longest uh, seasons ever, you know, with the most number of, uh, of, of races, point system, uh, fastest lap for the point. So it's a bit unfair to compare to the past, you know? So, they, I mean, but all, all records are there to be broken. So, but in any case, I, I don't think that a, a race driver is, is is focused or gives any, any importance to the fact of uh, adding more points, more race wins or more pole positions. I, I think that the only record that stands out is the number of world championships. That's my my feeling, you know. I mean, after that, you can have a look at most laps led, uh, more most points, more podiums, more uh, races in a row. But I, I've never, I, I don't think that not not any racing driver that I know, including myself, I've been ever focused on that on the percentage of race wins. I think that the important, the only thing that matters is the number of world championships that you retire with. That's uh, really the important one. Do you think? He's motivated by this record, this unbeaten record that Red Bull have this year, 12 wins from 12 races. Do you think that is a great source of inspiration, if you like, for the team? We've got to see how, how long we can keep this going. Stati you don't set off with uh, the ambition of breaking all records statistically. I think what motivates race teams and drivers is to win to, and to keep winning. And and naturally from that flows the 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 statistics that you get so far and have not been beaten or you've maintained a record of a run of nine wins is becomes a thing later on and I think that uh, sure you want to go down in history as the winningest then it does become another objective perhaps we're tantalizingly close to these all-time records in every almost every department um, to be achieved and I th I just think going back to what we were saying earlier about Red Bull Pedro's completely right. You know, throughout all the seasons, even when they were being dominated by Mercedes, they produced incredibly successful competitive cars. If they manage to polish off all these records at the end of the season, they can sit back. And I saw a quote from Adrian saying that he's sort of warming up to retirement now. Um, but he can sit back and, and Christian can and the whole lot can sit back 
and enjoy a, a lovely glass of red wine sitting in front of the fire at Christmas and think back on themselves of what an amazing achievement. But we're not there yet. And uh, there's many a slip twixt cup and lip, as they say, Tom. Well, let's talk about if they do slip this weekend, who are going to be their closest challengers? I mean, last year, what was it? Charles Leclerc qualified second, finished third. George Russell finished the race second. Who do we think are going to be their closest challenges? Wow. And I think no one knows, really. I mean, what we are learning this season is that we are going to each Grand Prix and it's like uh, not even the, 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 own, I mean, the race teams know how competitive they will be. I mean, uh, Ferrari was very competitive in in a race uh, in Spa, for example, uh, uh, where you uh, a race where you have to raise your right height quite a lot because of uh, of uh, the Rouge section, and uh, everyone was expecting Ferrari to lose more downforce or being more sensitive to right height than other teams, and suddenly they they, they finished. It. I mean, Leclerc did, uh, did a fantastic job and finished third. So it is very difficult to say, really, and I'm not prepared to say. I have no idea. All I know is that it will be very tight because it's naturally a small uh, or quite a short lap, 4.2 kilometers, uh, and, and the differences will be very, very small, uh, down to the, the hundreds, thousands. Uh, and there will be a lot of teams that will be very evenly matched, and I hope Aston Martin is one of them as well. So what can you say about Aston Martin, Pedro? You know, you can't, you've sworn to secrecy. Uh, but they say, they seem to... Sl- well, people say they've slid backwards, but I think it's other teams have found found bigger gains, maybe the gains that Aston Martin had found earlier in the season. Um, well, I think that, yeah, as you say, Damon, I mean, the front of the grid has become incredibly close. Uh, there's been teams like McLaren that have made a, an incredible uh, leap in in performance uh, since since they introduced their upgrade in, in Austria. And we needed to raise our game if we want to get back to the finishing on the podium. You know, I mean, that is clear. But the team is working flat out on it. Uh, we know we know uh, why we were not as competitive in, in the last few races. So I just uh, think we need to we need to just uh, continue developing a car like we've done all season. Really, not look too much at what other people are doing. They're, they're doing a great job, but I mean, we are also we have done a fantastic job so far with six podiums. So let's let's still understand that there is an incredible uh, end of season, 10 races to go. We are in the middle of a development race. Every one of, every every team is, and, and we just have to wait and see, you know, I mean, uh, keep faith on uh, what we have achieved so far. And uh, let's hope that no matter what happens, all of us, we get closer to Red Bull. Because I think what the Formula One needs is that everyone get closest the gap, not only because we want uh, to fight for victories, but also because I think Formula One needs teams fighting for victory in the future against Red Bull. And this is something that uh, we need to focus. Pray tell, Pedro, you know, you say you know why you've slipped back in the last few races. Come on, can you share anything with us? Because it's been one of the, it was one of the mysteries as we went into the summer break is what's happened to Aston Martin? Where have they gone? Tom, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, an engineer, you know, I mean, I'm just, uh, but I, I speak with uh, our team, you know, with our, all our members and I get, I get this this feeling, this very positive feeling that they know exactly what's going on. They know exactly where they have to focus on and they're focusing on. So I have this, uh, I have, I'm very relaxed. You know, I know that, I I mean, I want to congratulate other teams because they've done a fantastic job, but this is not game over. You know, it's not like uh, we are done. That's it for the season. No way. We are still uh, gradually and we gradually improve our car. And uh, it is, it gives you this sense of peace when you know where the problem well not the problems where the areas of improvement are and uh, because when you focus on the areas that are not that critical you might lose a bit the focus you know but we know exactly where the 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 areas the improvement areas are and uh, and we're working flat out so that's why i'm so so much looking forward to sandboard because uh, obviously we had a pretty good result in spa with fifth from Fernando and uh, we were just uh, very we are very close from the guys in front it's true that we are also very close from the guys behind and that's the beauty about formula 1 but we have slipped back i repeat other people possibly have done a better job than us in developing the car so far but it will come guys you, you got this there's another what i'm interested in for the rest of this season till the end is whether anybody is going to make use of the budget cap um, advantage they have, in other words, 
Red Bull obviously has a less of a, a budget um, deficit, if you like, or, or advantage um, than because they did so well last year. So the teams that didn't do well, like Aston Martin, they've got the budget to spend. They've also got a window they can spend it. Are they going to spend it? Because I, I heard from James Vowles that he was saying that he's not going to spend any more time, waste another iota of his energy on the 2023 car. He's putting all their resources towards 2024. What we thought would happen would be as the season goes on, people would be able to keep developing their car and close the gap to people like Red Bull, who presumably don't have much more space to spend anything, even though they might have the money. And we'd see a closing up. But what might happen is that people just go to hell with that. We're just going to go and start developing 2024 car. So where does that leave the rest of this season? Tom, what do you think? The regulations aren't changing much between this year and next year. So I, I don't really see, unless you're going to do a fundamental change, maybe that's what Williams have got planned. But if, if you're going to keep with the same philosophy, I don't see any advantage in stopping the development of this car because it's really going to be a carryover car into, into 2024. So I think you'll see a lot of teams not making a new chassis next year to save money and give them more cash to spend on wind tunnel time and whatever else they want to spend it on. So I'm not sure. I, I, OK, if that's the real Williams are doing that, but I think you'll see the likes of Aston pushing right until the end of the year. So I think we could see a closing up of the grid. I think Max is going to have the cars are going to be larger in his mirrors than they have been. So I'm I'm being positive, Damon. I think we're going to have a, a closer being run in. I was, I was just asking <laughs> yes. the question, Tom. Yes. Nobody, <laughs> but I think we're I going to have asking, a closer I run would, in. You're giving me the answer I'd hope to hear, which is that they're going to carry on and close the gap. So it should be getting to the. It might get towards the end of the season, and actually, Red Bull won't be so dominant and won't be winning races. Um, that would be great, but it sounds to me like they, some teams, have decided it's in terms of time they have. And the ability they have to fill that gap um, that they have from, due to the budget cap, that they are just going to say, I can't, we can't waste more time on this car. I mean, you're right. Maybe it's maybe it's just particularly with someone like Williams where they've just gone, OK, well, this is we need to start with a totally different chassis. Comp, whole, the whole concept needs to be different, in which case there is no point in developing this one because it's not going to apply to the, the 2024 car. But anyway, what, you know, the rest of the season, I think there could be some. Uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be some some closing up of the gap on, on Red Bull. And, and Toto Wolff has said there's no point Mercedes focusing on next year's car until they fully understand this year's car. And we've seen huge fluctuations in performance from them so far this year. So they've got to get to grips with what they have, given the regulation stability over the winter coming up, before they focus on the 24 car. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to be close, but... Guys, we've segued beautifully into what was going to be the second half of this show, which is who's got a point to prove in the second half of 2023. We've discussed Aston Martin already. Let's start with Checo Perez. He's got two wins, three seconds and two thirds so far this year. How important is it for him to get that P2 in the Drivers' Championship to secure his future with the team? Good question, Tom. I mean, I, we, we're talking about Checo only because the last few races, especially, I mean, he 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 never made it into Q3, you know, and uh, that really, really was uh, determining his end results. So if we were discussing Checo now after five races, uh, no one would, would have a, one doubt that he would continue one more year. Maybe we would be talking about an extension of a two, three-year <laughs> contract. So... I think that uh, as a racing driver, you 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 are worth what your last races are. You know, if you finish strong, the champ. If if Checo improves uh, his qualifying, especially because there's nothing wrong with his race pace and his uh, his races. It's just that when you qualify far back, it's a lot more difficult to make it from P14, P15. Not not so much a problem for Max, though. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay, but we're talking about Max, you know, and uh, that's the whole issue, isn't it? Is that compared to Max, everyone. May, might look ordinary but that red bull if you measure their performance on what on checo has delivered this year then they they wouldn't be so dominant so you know you, you they still need some bet more performance from 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 checo they need some reassurance it seems like they they are backing him up uh to yes my mind. absolutely so, and that's why yeah. if you if you were red bull you would wait until the end of the year no to to really take a decision on 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 the future of checo 
however uh, who would you put in that in that car that would uh, guarantee you uh, that he would be closer than than max Ad, an available driver obviously don't don't say fernando or luis or, or there's one obvious candidate isn't there pedro uh, he's done two races so far this year for alpha tauri daniel ricardo yeah exactly that's a question it's a really good question so would you put daniel in the car instead of uh of Checo, would he be closer to Max? Maybe he, he would be, but maybe, I don't know. Well, Helmut Marco told us on F1 Nation um, after the Belgian Grand Prix that he thought Lewis and Alonso might be closer to Max than Checo is, but really he doesn't see anyone beating Max. So it doesn't matter who you put alongside him, you're going to have a, a de facto number one driver in Max and a number two in whoever it is. So when you're weighing up whether it's Checo or Daniel Ricciardo, how much faster is Daniel going to be? It's a bit early to say. He's only done two races back. But Checo brings, you know, a huge fan base in Mexico and Central, that whole Central American region, doesn't he? That's, I, I imagine a lot of cans of Red Bull are sold in that part of the world because of Checo Perez. So you've got to weigh that in as well, right? Well, if, if you put Luis or Fernando in that car, it wouldn't be easy, huh? What, managing the relationship between Max and that person? It, it, it wouldn't be easy to say that Max would still beat them. It would be very, very challenging for Max and for for Fernando and Luis because they are, I mean, I consider them to be the best three drivers in the grid. So it would be very, very, uh, it would be down to details. Like tennis is, for example, you know, when you get to uh, on the, you know, you remember the era with the Djokovic and, and Rafa Nadal and, and Roger Federer, uh, it would be down to the last set of uh, it would depend if we're playing on clay on grass or or cement you know and 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 this is what it would be when you get the three drivers driving the same car it would be down to the wire because that's what sport is and it would be down to the little details how you wake up on a sunday morning how you drop the clutch initially or you know the strategic calls from your team at one point because the it would be very evenly matched between the three that's my my view anyway I love the way you say it depends how you wake up in the morning. I did an interview with Fernando last year in which he said he knows when he opens his curtains in the morning whether he's going to have a good day or a bad day. Yes. But but Tom, when you wake up in the morning, you also have this feeling, you know, of it's going to be a good day. I'm going to to be I don't know, I am more eloquent. I'm going to be, you know, have uh, be faster uh, taking decisions uh, or when I ask questions, you know, when you do all the interviews in the <laughs> in the press conferences. I, I, I think it's the same for every human being, but athletes are pushed to the limit. And uh, sometimes uh, it's just about feeling, you know. I, I have been cycling this summer every morning and I, I, there were mornings where I started cycling and after one kilometer, I wanted to turn back and get home. You know, I, I couldn't move the bike. You know, I was I feeling I was feeling tired. I, I had no energy. Uh, would I have a race then? I would be beaten easily by anyone. So I think this is the same for any racing driver, any athlete at the top uh, top end. End, you know, uh, you always feel your body. You always listen to your body. You always know exactly where you are. But you have to play the psychological game of making sure that your rivals don't know how weak you com- you might feel on a particular day. So, the, all I'm saying is this is the beauty of of motor racing, of sport. You know, it's just uh, playing with your you know the little details. At the moment, Max doesn't need that because no matter what, he's he's on a different level. His car is better than the rest. He's uh, faster than Checo, you know, and has a gap, and he knows he has a gap. He doesn't need to uh, wake up in the morning on a Sunday and, and and think, oh, I have it, I'm going to win today, because he knows on Saturday night before he gets into the into the bed that he will win on Sunday. It's a bit di- different, you no? Know? It's a bit different, but I would love to see Max being pushed in that manner. Pedro, you made an interesting, reminded me of a story when you were talking about putting on the front and not showing any weakness. I remember the story where uh, Keki Rosberg, I think it was in Detroit or somewhere stinky hot, it was really, really humid and everyone's complaining about the heat. So he went and sunbathed on the pit wall with his uh, overalls down. <laughs> so made it look made it abundantly clear to everyone that he liked the heat you know so uh you know they they do play games you, you touched on something which i think has been really in everyone's mind which is we've seen max's dominance and all credit to him and and, and red bull but we, we want to see some challenge within the team 
you know, no disrespect to to Checo, but you know, what if Lewis was in in the same team as Red Bull? I mean, that would be box office. That is your prize fight. That is, you know, Anthony Joshua and um, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> 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 the other guy anyway uh, the, anyway the, uh, you know but uh, let's say it's Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier and the, uh, but I'm going back a bit there but anyway yeah if this is your this is what you're after is is the rivalry yes yeah. absolutely and you know if it's if it's if it's Fernando we don't care because Fernando is is such a great competitor and a, a fascinating character. I don't want it to be Fernando because I want him to be an, uh, for many years uh, in Aston Martin. You know, okay. So, so, okay. So, so maybe we get just, Max to go to just, Aston Martin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just keep focusing on, on, on Red Bull, man. I mean, <laughs> but the modern team structures are to have one dominant driver. We're seeing it now with Max and Red Bull. We saw it with Lewis and Mercedes. Prior to that, it was Schumacher and Ferrari. It seems to me that. That is the chosen structure that the team principals are going for because it avoids any intra-team conflict. It it makes it very clear who who the star is uh, from a marketing point of view, et cetera, et cetera. Our next partner is NordVPN. If you're looking for a way to protect your privacy online without the fear of hackers accessing your data, NordVPN is the ultimate online security solution for anyone who wants to browse the internet with confidence. We share so much personal and sensitive information online, like banking information and passwords or logins. It's important that we ensure it remains safe from prying eyes, especially if you find yourself regularly connecting to unsecured public Wi-Fi or shared networks. NordVPN uses expert encryption technology to protect your online activity, making it impossible for hackers and cyber criminals to intercept your data. And lucky for you, we have an exclusive deal for our listeners when you head over to nordvpn.com forward slash F1 Nation. There are a multitude of benefits and incredible features on offer that can help you level up your online security across their standard plus and complete plans. And every purchase of a two-year plan means you will receive four bonus months. And if you use our special URL, nordvpn.com slash F1 Nation, you'll get an extra bonus month on top. And that's not all. If you're looking for a way to elevate your streaming potential, you'll be pleased to know that NordVPN also offers lightning fast speeds allowing you to stream, download, and browse without any lag or buffering. And it even comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Start safeguarding your online activity today. Get your exclusive NordVPN deal at nordvpn.com slash F1 Nation. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Let's now go through just some of the other teams. With regards to Mercedes, uh, Hamilton's had two seconds and two thirds so far this year. Do you think he's exceeding expectations in that car? Lewis has always exceeded expectations. I mean, not well, maybe he doesn't exceed it. Maybe we just come to expect that from Lewis. He just somehow always manages to just go beyond what the car should do or the achievement should do, you know, and he's, and he's stretching his legs a little bit against George, isn't he now? Um, something's happened there and it's, you know, I think. But what that, do you think has happened there? That's an interesting point. I think, I think Damon, to be fair, is uh, uh, Luis has felt very uncomfortable with this, uh, with the Mercedes car since the ground, ground effect was introduced, uh, extreme porpoising effect it had, and he was never, ha- never happy with the, since Mercedes moved on on their concept car on the on the concept you know of the the side pods and and it seems to be a more uh, a, a car with less issues or with a wider scope to drive and uh, and, and set up. Uh, I, I feel like Luis has made a, a a step, you know, or has upgraded his uh, his speed again, you know. So he's managed to he's now driving the car uh, where he wants it to be. He's uh, setting up the car and uh, and pushing it to the limits while he was never comfortable with, with the previous uh, ground effect uh, concept. So I think that there's something in there uh, and uh, that's why he's uh, we have seen a, a better Luis in the past few, few races, since Monaco, I would say. The point is he's getting what he wants now out of Mercedes to, and his performances have improved relative to George over that time because and whether that is psychological whether that is real is is beside the point but if if the driver next to you 
gets what he wants, then George, to some degree, is going to have to go along with it. It was the same with Checo at the start of the season with Red Bull, because Checo was quite happy with the car, but and Max was complaining quite quite a lot that he didn't like it. And the car has now come to him in the way he likes to drive, and lo and behold, uh, Checo can't touch him. So, you know, this is this is the power of a driver with the, with the talent, the reputation of, of someone like Lewis, you know, that inevitably the weight of the team goes behind that because it's the best bet. It's been proven, you know, and so their future, it, it will be determined by the strength of that, that individual. What about Ferrari then? Coming into the season, I think we would have all thought they would have had more than a second and a couple of thirds uh, at the summer break. What do you think the mindset of the drivers is going to be going into these last 10? That's It's difficult to say. I mean, uh, what I would say about the Ferrari car, it looks from the outside like a difficult car to drive in a way similar to the Mercedes prior to Monaco. Uh, we've seen like uh, Charles having issues in qualifying, spinning, like remember Miami when it's a very sensitive car to the wind, wind direction with to the wind gust. It's very sensitive, seems to be very sensitive on right height, seems to be having some porpoising. If you look at the onboard cameras of the Ferrari drivers, you can see that, that their heads are really, you know, uh, banging uh, during during the, the, the long straights. Spa as an example. Uh, it's a difficult car, but it's still fast, you know. So I would say that anything can happen, but it is one of those the most difficult cars to drive in the grid, I would say. I was interested that you didn't include Charles Leclerc in your top drivers on the grid at the minute. You said it's Hamilton, Alonso and Verstappen. I thought you might have put Leclerc in there, Pedro. Well, I mean, I could have put Lando Norris there, Russell as well. You know, I, I think that they are all outstanding drivers. Don't get me wrong, you know, but I'm just looking at the most consistent drivers in an era. And those have to be Max, Luis, and Fernando. It doesn't matter uh, what compound, what cars they're driving, what teammates they have, what circuits they're driving. They're always there. They're always delivering something special. Now, it doesn't matter if they are fighting for victories or like in Fernando's case, fighting for getting into the Q3 or, uh, you know, getting the last point with, with an Alpine. They are always outstanding. They're always doing something different and, and special. You know, that's what I, makes me makes me admire these drivers. Charles is fantastic. I mean, for sure. But only time will tell if he gets into those top three. And that's something we will all know in the next few years. Going back to what you were saying, Ferrari, I forgot one, to, to mention one important thing is that if you look also, the car seems to be sens very sensitive to different tire compounds. So we see at Miami, you remember Carlos Sainz was flying in the, the first stint with the race, just was all over Fernando. Then they went to a different compound and he was he was gone, basically. It was, and Fernando did say at the, the race, it was a very lonely lonely race. Uh, and then uh, remember Charles with the, with the tires in, in, in Barcelona, you know, he, he went with a hard compound. He was nowhere on the first stint with a hard. And then on the last stint, he put the same compound and he was flying and he, he couldn't really un, uh, understand why. So it is, it's not an easy car. It's a fast car, but it has to, they have some, some issues uh, for sure. Damon, would you rather be driving this year's Ferrari or this year's McLaren? And I'm talking about the McLaren post the Austria update. Absolutely, McLaren. They seem to be making right decisions and going in the right direction. I mean, if, if, if we look at uh, what Lando did, McLaren did in, in Silverstone, it's impressive. It is possibly the race where anyone has been closest to Red Bull, to Max Verstappen, all throughout the, the season. And you cannot do that in Silverstone without um, an incredible car and driver, you know, I mean, but especially the, the leap they made is incredible uh, one race to the other. When a car is competitive in Silverstone, it's normally competitive everywhere else because you need downforce, high speed, low speed, you need efficiency, top speed. I mean, okay, they lack, they lack a little bit of top speed, but, and, and in fact, if you look at that race, going back to Silverstone, if, if Lando would have believed that his car was so competitive and would be so close to, to Max, he would have made Max's life a lot more difficult when he was overtaken. He, he was just, it was a typical overtake of Max, don't make me lose time. Go by, please. My worries, 
will come from the back because I want a podium. Uh, but had he known his level of competitivity during the, that race, he he could have uh, fought for a for a win for sure. So be careful with McLaren. I think that they have a very strong package for the next ten races and twenty twenty four. We've got Rob Marshall coming as uh, you know chief technical officer. They've got David Sanchez coming from Ferrari. You feel there is momentum now at McLaren. They've got two really strong drivers. I mean, really strong drivers. Give me a better driver pairing on the grid than Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri. The Oscar Piastri of 2024 will, of course, be stronger than he is now. But I thought his sprint podium at Spa was very impressive. Anyway, so McLaren is going places. Look, there's one more team I think we should talk about going into the second half of the season. And that is Alpine because there were some seismic changes at Spa last time out. Otmar Safnauer is gone. He's been replaced by an interim team principal in Bruno Famine. Then Alan Permain, who's been at the team for more than 30 years, has been replaced as sporting director by Julian Rouse, son of British touring car championship legend Andy Rouse. But, you know, Julian came in last year to to front their young driver program and suddenly he's got now one of the biggest jobs in the Formula One team. So he's got a lot to learn. But when you have so much change at a team, I wonder how it affects the guys on the ground and, you know, their ambition of being the fourth fastest car by the end of the year. Is that actually feasible now? It's always been hand around had different labels put on it all the way back to uh tolman you know i mean it's had just different labels slapped on it all throughout the years isn't it i don't know what your team you call it is it tolman is it benetton is it renault is it alpine there was another one lotus lotus. It was lotus for a while as well so i mean i don't know the guys probably who've been there for a lot long i mean alan permain of course has left so that's a, that's a big change for them because that's someone who's been you know, throughout all of it, and probably one of the very few people who've managed to see it through all that length of time. But yeah, I, I suppose the problem is when you have a, a workforce who are used to the management keep coming and going and changing, they become a little bit skeptical about the new lot who come in. You know, why should they trust this new lot have come in? They will, they'll only be there a couple of years if that. So it, it's not yeah. good. Tom, big changes in Formula One in, are never good in the short term. That's something that we all have learned from this. Whether they will be good in the long term, something that uh, we don't know. But what I can tell you is that to build a competitive car, you need talent, you know, and to to get the talent, you need stability. And that's why I think it's stability is so important in Formula One. It's just that you need the best engineers, designers, mechanics, drivers as well, you know, and you will only be able to attract this talent if you have stability. So is this the first step into having stability? Something that remains to be seen, but in the short term, it's always an added challenge. And the people and the talent that you have, sometimes it's difficult to retain as well. When they see these big names, people like Alan Permain or Pat Fry, a living legends in, in Formula One, the guys with an incredible amount of experience know-how championships i mean th- these guys have all my 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 respect so it's going to be difficult in the short term for alpine they're a great team as well so let's let's wait and see but uh, it will be tough Wow, it's our favourite bit of the show, isn't it, guys? Ask the Nation. For those of you who are new listeners, please email in your questions in a voice note to f1nation at f1.com and we'll do our best to answer them in a future episode. Right, question one is from Jonathan in Denver, Colorado, and he says, Hey folks, all teams seem to be relatively good at pit stops, but it seems like Red Bull still dominates in this area. Why do some teams seem to do better than others at pit stops? Is there a pecking order in the garages? Love the pod. Regards, Jonathan. Wow, that is a great question, really. And honestly, there's something that not even the the, the race teams know. You know, if they knew, they would all be the fastest. But uh, it's down to two main things. It's uh, tooling, so all the tools, all the jacks uh, having the right uh, right, tools. design to gain those extra hundreds and then uh, to to human performance so you need the 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 most fit mechanics 
the faster, the most reliable, the guys that uh, uh, don't crack under pressure, that they can practice and they have the time to practice in the workshop uh, hundreds of times per week. So all in all, uh, and then you need you need uh, to take the decision of how much do you want to risk a pit stop because for gaining 500, you can lose half a second or maybe one second. So, but all in all, it's down to tooling and practice and talent, like everything in in Formula One. And stopping in the right place as well, Pedro. Yeah, but Damon, racing drivers never make mistakes, no? That, that's something that that's we agreed kept, before the interview. That's what I kept telling them. I, yeah. We yeah. always stop in the right yeah. centimeter, you know, in exactly in the same same spot and the right spot. The stopping in the right place, I'm, I'm sort of making a joke of it, but actually, you imagine you're prepared for the car to come in. You've got the wheel gun and you're kneeling down. You can't move. You're you, Basically, the car has to stop precisely where you well within about six inches at least but you want it right where you're going to put your gun on the nut and and fire it and so yeah stopping the right place is really critical for the driver to do it and it's not easy to do i'll be honest you know because the pressure is on to i know they've got a pit lane speed limit but let's say the p- speed limit is 50 miles an hour you're still trying to stop the car accurately from about you know 10 feet outside the box to you know exactly where you need to stop and it's slippery as well so lots of really lots of things that can go wrong and imagine what the heart rate is like on those guys when it's a championship situation uh, as well uh, so they do train a, a lot for this they do a lot of stretching they do a lot of uh, preparation and before we go to the grid uh, you'll see them all pushing the car into the slot it seems it's in i was amazed by this because in such a sophisticated world as Formula One, when they practice pit stops, they actually just rely on uh, four guys pushing the car into the box yeah. and they and they get <laughs> someone to sit in the car. <laughs> it's, it all looks pretty Heath Robinson, but, uh, but that's how they practice and they get it in their mind, the, the ritual that they need to do. But think about it, a pit stop now, if it's two seconds, that's 1,001, 1,002. There's loads of time. It's really, you've got loads of time. And, and, and now that you've gone into the driver scenario in, in a pit stop, I mean, let's not forget that in the past we had refueling. So we, I had the, the time to select neutral, wait for the, you know, wait for the lollipop and then select first and go. Now there's no time to select neutral. You just go in first gear, we pull the clutch, you adjust the brake balance, you go rearwards on the brake balance to gain a bit of, of time just breaking into the exact spot. And then oh, we've God. gone from lollipops to lights. And the reason for that is because the driver reacts faster to a light than to a lollipop going up and it's more precise. So all in all, it's small little details in every area. So as well as Damon pointed out on the on the driver driver behavior. I'm going to claim something. This is a claim, a heavy claim, as we say in surfing, which is, do you remember when people used to put their hand over the top of the, the right front tire? You know, so the mechanic would, would sit there and he put his hand and you could see from the cockpit whether you were parked in the right place. That was my idea. I brought that in after Aida and I lost the world world title or something like that. To We lost a Grand Prix to, to Michael. And Williams complained bitterly, well, you never stopped in the right place. And I said, well, how am I supposed to see where I can stop? So he went back, he went through the ritual, I said, right, in future, I want you to put your hand over the top of the right front and I'll park right underneath your hand. I'll put the crown of the tyre right underneath that. And that became a kind of standard practice for a long time until the lights came. Well, so that's fantastic, David, Damon. You're legend. You're yes. legend. I love He's that He's a legend, story. man. Damon, and, and, and I'll <laughs> yeah. tell you something more. You know who... The guy was that said, the glove is very good, is very good, but I need someone, uh, please change the glove color because black is the same color as the tire. Oh, is that, what it, that, is that yes, yours? Yes, so, yes. Yeah. So whenever you see a mechanic with an orange orange glove, <laughs> oh, that's what was my suggestion. So I think between you and oh. we, we sorted out all the pit stop issues. Thank you. We're cut from the same cloth, Pedro. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure there's the many other thing. guys that said the same, you know, so that it's just... <laughs> we got the big guns out this week listeners um look jonathan great question thank you very much uh also worth noting that what charles leclerc's fastest pit stop in spa last time out 2.19 seconds incredible speed and the tires are heavier this year of course with the the change from 13 to 18 inch wheels so incredible what's going on in formula one the tires are lighter tom but the wheels are heavier well, so what what the mechanics have to lift is heavy. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> Sorry, that you're dealing with racing drivers now. We're we're going to nip yes. the whole. Whoa! <laughs> Let's move on to question two now. 
Hello, gang. This is Jay calling in from St. Louis, Missouri. I absolutely love the show. Question for Damon. Damon, on George Harrison's webpage, there's a photo of you and George, and I was wondering if you could provide a bit of context to the photo. Um, looks like you're maybe in a race suit at the back of a garage at some Grand Prix or something. Additionally, if you could maybe tell a story or two of George as a Formula One fan, that'd be fantastic. All righty. Best wishes. Okay, Jay. So that's a very interesting question. Uh, if you're interested in the Beatles, of course, and George Harrison, but uh, George was a huge racing fan and it goes back to his days when he was in Liverpool because they used to have a Grand Prix at Aintree and he used to sneak in to watch the car racing under the fence. And I'm, I met someone the other day and he said he knew George because they both used to sneak in at the same time. So it goes back to the uh, the late the late fifties or mid fifties or something, and he used to go and watch the greats, you know, Moss and and Fangio at the same time, I presume, as as playing with uh, with John Lennon and, and and Paul, and being in the being a Beatle. Eventually, he was a Beatle and then became famous. And then he went to the Grand Prix and he it, you know followed the racing and got to know uh, Sir Jackie Stewart very well, and he even wrote a song about racing which is called the master of going faster and i think it's about jackie but basically it's a, a generic song about being a really good racing driver and so yeah he was around those days and, and obviously knew my dad and then and then i got to know him a little bit because he also knew barry sheen very well who's a bike racer and so he bumped into him a few times and then the long story short he was there in 94 he came down to adelaide and supported me when i was racing uh, against Michael Schumacher, the great showdown in, in 94 in Adelaide. And uh, <laughs> he had a video camera. And uh, so he was playing with this. In the early days, it was quite a novelty to have a, a digital video camera. Or what it, it may have been analog, I can't remember. But anyway, and so he filmed the whole thing when he went into Michael's garage after he'd won the race. And he asked a few questions with all the press. <laughs> he was holding his camera up and going, hey, Michael, tell us why you crashed into Damon. <laughs> That's my... George Harrison impression, but um, so yeah, he was he was a lovely, lovely obviously you know he's a lovely, lovely guy, um, and so that's possibly why. So he was a huge supporter, and I dare I say friend, but someone I uh, I love very much and uh, had the privilege of knowing. So that's the explanation for that. Great story, Damon, and I'm sure the Master of Going Faster was written about you and Jackie Stewart. I think it was latterly applied, perhaps it could, could have been applied, but I don't think I was the master of going fast. So maybe for one year, maybe for one year, Tom. Oh, Jonathan and Jay, thank you very much for your questions. And please do get in touch because we're, we love the Ask the Nation section of the show. So we will do our best to answer more questions in the future. Now, guys, the 2023 season is back and so is F1 Fantasy. Our team, F1 Nation Racing, took a not so well-earned vacation during the summer break. But we're back in the factory working hard after a very disappointing first half of the season. We're 884th in the F1 Nation World Championship. Before the break, we had Verstappen, Alonso, Ricardo, Ocon and Norris as our drivers, with Red Bull and Aston Martin as our constructors. Ahead of Zandvoort, we've made a few changes. We've taken out Ricardo, Ocon and Aston Martin and replaced them with Piastri, Albon and Williams. So let's see how they get on. At the front, MLN Racing is top of the standings with 3,759 points, followed by Trav F1 2724 in second and blank BGP in third. So very well done to you guys. F1 Fantasy is a lot of fun and it's free to play. You can join our league at any time. Just go to fantasy.formula1.com, enter your team and search for the F1 Nation World Championship so you can play against us and other listeners. And remember, you have until the start of qualifying for the Dutch Grand Prix on Saturday to make changes to your team. Come on then, podium predictions for Zanvoort. Who's going to go first? First... We should. I mean, after after listening all our podcasts, you have to say Max Verstappen. I mean, it would it wouldn't make sense, yeah. So, yeah, I, I would go for Max Verstappen and uh, Checo second, third Fernando. Right. Why not? I, I think you know, you know. It's. I mean, with the Max thing, I I'd, I actually want to see them complete this record breaking run. I I don't want to see them anything to happen. So it's Max Max on the you know Max pole position fastest lap wins the race um three cherries 
And the next person I'm going to say is Oscar Piastri and then Checo. How about that? Well, I'm going with Max. Uh, as Pedro says, I feel after everything we've said uh, on this week's show, he looks unbeatable. Something unusual is going to have to happen to stop Max winning. So Max won. I'm going to go for Lando Norris P2 and George Russell P3. Damon, do you fancy a guess as to who my guest is this week on Beyond the Grid? Oh, blimey. Well, why are you asking me that? I do listen to a lot of these whilst I'm mowing the lawn, by the way. So uh, it's extraordinary because when I go out and walk about on my lawn, I can hear all these past episodes of uh, Beyond the Grid, Tom. So it's, uh, my lawn is littered with greats of the past and uh, present. Um, well, anyway, mentally... Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't think. Who is it? Come on, so tell a me. So a former teammate of yours, Heinz oh. Harold Frentzen. Now, that's interesting because what he's, he's appeared, he's on Twitter or X as it's called now. You know, he, I've been following his tweets. He's hysterical. He's got such a dry sense of humor. I just, I just, he really is such a lovely guy. So I'd be very keen to hear that. Did you ask him about Damon and his relationship? Is, can you share oh, something of it did. with us? No, he, uh, come on. Oh, we didn't really go into that. There was so much else to talk to him about, and and I don't think it was. No, you're not, it's not all. There about was more me, to talk it? to him about than than, than Damon. Yeah, <laughs> still Damon. Damon ninety nine spec wasn't the true Damon. No, th that was the retirement pre retirement spec. <laughs> that was the can't wait to get out of here spec. Damon. That was, <laughs> Do you know? What? I had some text banter with Heinz Harold uh, during the summer break, in which he was asking me when's the show coming out. I told him when it was, and the next thing I knew, he'd put it on Twitter. So I, I had to get hold of him. I said, yeah. it's meant to be a surprise, at least until a bit closer to the time. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll take it. <laughs> he just copy and pasted our text conversation. Anyway, there you go. It's a, it's a great listen, and that comes out on Wednesday. And of course, if you want to hear more of your questions being answered, we had our Ask the Nation summer special last week, and then the first week of the summer break, was our summer quiz episode as well. So have a listen to those. But meantime, we'll be back next Monday with our review of the Dutch Grand Prix. My thanks to Damon and to Pedro for their time this week. Guys, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Tom. you, Tom. Thanks to everyone. See you in the Zand. We'll get, we'll get sand between our toes in Zandvoort. I'll see you there, guys. Yes, we'll have fun. F1 Nation is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios.